Good afternoon. This is Cynthia Kanaki with the ALS Association. Welcome and thank you for carving time out of your day to join us. This webinar is one of a series of monthly webinars focused on bringing information of a practical nature to those living with ALS. Recognizing the huge value caregivers provide families across the country, today's webinar highlights how durable medical equipment and assistive technology not only helps people diagnosed with ALS, but also supports caregiving. For your convenience, webinars and the associated slide decks are recorded and posted to the ALS Association website for post-live presentation viewing. Before I introduce our guests, let me invite you to participate in our webinar by posting comments or questions to the question box. I may be able to answer your question privately, or I can share your question or comment with our audience during the Q&A session. So let me introduce today's speaker. Elisa Brownlee is an assistive technology specialist with numerous credentials related to adaptive equipment, housing, and vehicles. Ms. Brownlee consults for the ALS Association Home Office and works with the ALS Association Greater Philadelphia Chapter. Please join me with a warm welcome for Elisa Brownlee. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm delighted to be here today to talk about how assistive technology can be used to help caregivers. Please note that if you would like a copy of this slide deck, I am happy to send it to you or you can email Cynthia. So I want to start off by saying I'm going to be talking about a lot of different products on the market, but I have no um, I have no financial interest in any of the products that I'm talking about today, and I have uh, no conflict of interest in terms of this program or presentation. Again, I will share my slides. Please email me. My email is here, uh, alisa.brownlee at als.org, and it will also be on the last slide. So I want to talk about smart speakers because they really do revolutionize the quality of life for people with disabilities. And you have either the Amazon Echo or the Google Home. And smart speakers can allow an individual to have control of their environment for a relatively low cost. So smart speakers can control lights and fans, air conditioners, anything that plugs into the wall. You can play your music on a smart speaker, read books. Not only will they be read out loud, but if you have a smart speaker with a screen, you will actually see the words on the screen. They can help keep you on schedule through calendars and lists. And most importantly, for those people that I serve with ALS, they tend to watch a lot of television. And caregivers will tell me all the time, I'm tired of changing the television for them. So a smart speaker can do that for you. And it is important to know that smart speakers do not care whether or not you were verbally speaking or giving commands through a speech generating device or smartphone. They follow commands, not voice. So you can use your smart speaker even if you cannot verbally speak. And the other thing a smart speaker can do to really assist a person with ALS to be independent, but also for their caregivers to be able to work or leave the home, is you can use smart locks. So an individual can be home alone and they can lock and unlock the door. So in other words, if a caregiver has to go out and they know a home health aide or, or a therapist is coming, the person with ALS can let that person in. So I always recommend people consider having a smart speaker with a screen because it allows you to see the person. It allows you to see a room or an event that you want to watch. So at the bottom right here, you see uh, an, an Amazon Echo Show. And the one on the left is an Amazon um, Spot. And so I have a spot upstairs and I have a show downstairs in my home. If for example, I had a loved one upstairs and I wanted to know if they're up or they need help. I can do what's called a drop-in. So I tell my smart speaker drop in on the spot and the spot will have for 10 seconds, it will have a blurred screen and it'll tell the person upstairs, Elisa is dropping in on you. Um, and once it's dropped in, I can see that person. I could also do a drop-in if I'm on my smartphone and I'm in the grocery store and I wanna check in on my loved one at home. 
So it does enable you to, to have that peace of mind that you can drop in anytime and see that your person is okay. Environmental control. So I mentioned about using uh, the smart locks. Well, you can also use a ring doorbell or other doorbell so that you can see who's at the door before you unlock it. It also enables the person not to have to get up to answer the door. We talk about energy conservation all the time with ALS. So we tell people, don't do things that you don't necessarily need to do. And so getting up and answering the door is one of those things. And then, as I mentioned, fans, thermostats, lights, anything. And also on the top right here is a garage door opener. Your smart speaker can raise and lower the garage door. And that use of an electronic doorbell, not only can it be placed on the door, but you can actually place the unit anywhere in the house. And if you want to, um, if your loved one needs you and they can still press the button, they can press the button and wherever you are, because this is hooked up to a smartphone, you will get an alert that they need something. So calling for help, it is the most crucial assistive technology that can be used in the home. So you always want your loved one to have a way to call for help because you as a caregiver want to know that they need something. So you need to determine what kind of call do they need? Do they need something just in the house or do they need something to make an exterior call to like a smartphone or a landline? You want to look at what dexterity does the user have. If the user can still speak, baby monitors are great. Um, and if the person has limb movement but they can't speak, you know any kind of any type of bell, a cow bell, a dinner bell, anything to attract attention. So there is a device called an Easy Call Bell and Alarm, and they are sold separately. So they're about um, one hundred and fifty-five dollars each. Um, but what this does, it is a wired system, but this blue triangular bell takes about a half ounce of pressure. And once the person puts pressure on it, whether or not that's from head movement, you can put this at their feet, at their elbow, under their jaw, you're gonna get a, a very loud beep until they let go. So I have some caregivers who, because the individual might be wearing like a trilogy or a BiPAP, they opt to sleep in a different room. So this way the caregiver can know that the person needs help. And if you're sleeping in a separate room and feel like you can't hear this for some reason, you can use a baby monitor. So you put a baby monitor right next to the alarm and then you will hear the alarm go off. Wireless um, doorbells are great for people that have um, finger dexterity. So you place the, the portion that has a button at, on the wheelchair, or you can put it around a lanyard on someone's neck. And the caregiver, wherever they are, carries this one, um, the chime. Um, and if the person is in need of help, they just press the button. And wherever the caregiver is, they get a ding dong. And these can be battery operated or they can actually plug into the wall. And you can get more than one unit. So you can have one unit on each floor should you want to do so. Adapted wireless pagers are good. These are pagers that are worn around the waist area. And the one on the left is a personal pager that not only chimes, but it vibrates. So if you have a caregiver that has some hearing issues and they can't hear the chime, you can switch this button to vibrate and it will buzz against their, uh, their waist. These are adaptable. So if the individual can still press the button, they can do so. If not, a switch can be plugged in here. And I'll talk about switches in a moment, but basically they are devices that are are similar to a, like a joystick on a wheelchair. What does the joystick do? It sends a current to the machine to go forward, back, left, right. A switch does the same thing for an electronic device. It sends a current to go on or off, all right? So if somebody can't press the button, we can put a switch on the body anywhere there's muscle movement. So say you have somebody sitting in a power wheelchair and they have head movement. I could put a switch on their head array they press this, they press the switch or, or hit the switch with their head and the chime goes off. So if you would need to call for help outside the home, 
you can use both a landline and a cell phone. The most traditional way of calling for help is the quote unquote, I've fallen and can't get up. And I'm sure you've all seen these commercials on television. There are emergency alert systems that are monitored, meaning there is someone always on the end of the phone. There is an intercom that is placed somewhere in the home. And if the individual falls or needs help, they press a button and it goes through the intercom to a call center. And that call center sees the number that's calling and under it will be instructions. So I have a lot of people who say to me, I don't wanna use this system because I'm concerned 911 is gonna be called all the time. That is simply not true. On the operator's monitor is going to be who to call in the event of an emergency. It can be your neighbor, your son, your daughter, your spouse, and then 911. So oftentimes these systems are on lanyards, but they do have wrist systems like this one down here on the left. And if the individual can't press the button with their hands, but they have foot control, we often put these around somebody's ankle. These systems are monitors that, as I mentioned, so there is a fee, there is an installation fee, usually around $80 and a monthly fee of around $50. These lanyards, either the lanyards or the, the wrist control, they are waterproof. So you want the individual to wear them at all times, including the shower or bath. So I mentioned switch uh, adaptable pagers. Well, you can also get switch adaptable life alert systems. So if the individual can't press the button on their wrist or around their neck, you can get switch adaptable life alerts so the individual presses the switch and it makes that call to the monitored center. Pardon me. There are cell phone life alerts. These usually cost around $30 a month. They can have an add-on GPS in case your person um, likes to take walks or go out on their wheelchair and you wanna know where they are. So that is an added feature. But if you have, like me, cut the landline and you only have cell phone, you still can get a life alert system on your cell phone. There is a really good article that is free of charge from Consumer Reports on how to choose a medical alert system. And the article basically walks you through and helps you decide which system you need. If you don't wanna pay that installation fee and the monthly fee for the monitored service, there are emergency alert systems that are a one-time purchase. They are specialized telephones that you pre-record a message on saying, this is Elisa Brownlee, I have fallen, please come over or please send help. I press, or, or excuse me, I save that message on this phone and it is tied to a lanyard or a wrist button here. And once I hit the button, this phone starts making calls for me, this number, which is pre-programmed, this number, which is pre-programmed. So if this person doesn't answer, it jumps to this person and jumps to this person, and then it'll continue jumping back and forth. So your last number that you might want to put as an emergency is 911, but know that two or three people will be called before that. The Apple Watch 4 and above also has fall detection. So there are some people who say to me, I don't want to wear that lanyard. I don't want to wear the wrist, um, but I'll be willing to wear a watch. So the fall detection works. And I can, I can attest to this because I've fallen twice and my watch has gone off both times. So the watch is uh, connected to my smartphone and under my emergency contacts, I say who to call in the event of an emergency, obviously. So if my watch goes off, I get a, an alert on the watch. I see you have fallen, are you okay? Now, because I was okay, I answered yes. I hit the button on my watch. If I wasn't, if I have fallen and I can't hit that okay, my watch is gonna start dialing my emergency contacts for me until someone answers. And then it will give a pre-recorded message that I have fallen and it'll give them my GPS coordinates. So if you have somebody with ALS that can still speak 
but can't use their hands, there are ways to add, to use both a computer, a cell phone, a tablet. Um, so computer access can be done on a laptop or a desktop through software. There's Dragon Naturally Speaking, which has been around for years. Um, and then there's a new product called LipSurf, which works out of Google Chrome, much easier to use um, than Dragon, in my humble opinion. Um, and it is a monthly fee of $6 or less. There's a free version of LipSurf, and then there's a paid version. It's just um, much easier to use because it's... It, it really, um, you tell, sorry, you tell Google Chrome, open this, and it does. Dragon, you have to know which commands to give it. If somebody needs access to a cell phone and they can still speak, but they're really having um, hand difficulties, built into both Apple and Android are accessibility features. So under the Apple function, um, you can activate Hey Siri, which basically means it, it Siri, I don't have to touch the phone to get Siri to activate. I just say, Hey Siri, she says what, and I give her instructions, send a text or, you know, call so-and-so. Apple also has something called voice accessibility, and so does Google. Google's is called voice access. They both function in the same way, which means that the end user can get full control of their cell phone simply by speaking to it. What both programs do is they divide the phone up into a grid, as you can see pictured here. And if I wanted to open up my, um, my calendar here, I would tell the phone open to, and it's going to open to, and then under my calendar, everything's going to have a number so that I can continue to use my phone even if I can't use my hands. This will work on Instagram, it'll work on Facebook, um, anything that the, that is already downloaded into the phone will work with voice accessibility and Google Voice Access. Amplification can be used if somebody has low vocal volume, and usually this is due to decreased breath support, and so the caregiver will be like, I can't hear them, they can still speak, but I just can't hear them. So voice amplification is simply using a microphone in front of the mouth and it amplifies the voice through a speaker. This way, the caregiver can be in another room, um, but still hear their loved one. And these amplifiers come in wire, wired and wireless. I get them off of Amazon for about $60. You will see a lot of them um, were, are used by teachers in school uh, classrooms or college classrooms. So you know, the amplifiers will say great for teachers or, or but those are the good ones um, because they are designed to be small, compact, but really project your voice. If somebody is using a non-invasive ventilator, like the gentleman pictured here, that's a full face mask. So if you're wearing a full face mask, of course, you're not going to be able to project your voice. So we have used a transdermal microphone, which is the one pictured here. You put the microphone on the vocal cords and attach it to a voice amplifier, and that will amplify somebody's voice without having to take the mask off. There is a new device on the market called a speech device, and basically what this does is it puts a microphone on the outside of the BiPAP or Trilogy mask, and then that's plugged into an amplifier. So in terms of communication options, you have for caregivers, you, you, you want to absolutely have a backup system as well as a fully functional communication system. Uh, so that, that fully functional one, that might be an electronic communication system, but you need a backup system in place too. So the backup system that I always recommend is called rapid access, and it could be used with a letter board, a picture board, an eye gaze board here. And we find that the most communication breakdowns happen in the bathroom or the bedroom. And most times that's because somebody doesn't have their communication device with them. So using rapid access 
is a way to alleviate the communication breakdown. So the first thing you always want to do with your loved one is establish a yes, no, and maybe system. Please don't just answer or ask yes or no, because you're forcing the person to answer incorrectly. For example, it is cold and dreary here outside of Philadelphia today. If you said to me, do you wanna go outside? I don't know, is it raining? Cause not really, but if I'm answering yes, no, you're not giving me an option of, of saying maybe. So you always wanna do yes, no, maybe. You can of course do eye blinks. One blink equals yes, two blinks equals no. Not my preferred method per se, because sometimes I miss the blink um, or sometimes people get a lazy blink or, or it's hard for them to blink. So usually I will stand at the person's, uh, you know, at the bottom of the bed or I'll stand next to them and I'll put my hands out and I'll say, look to the right for yes, look to the left for no and look to the ceiling for maybe. So I've established a system in less than 10 seconds. As I mentioned, you can always use letter boards. I get a lot of people who say to me, well, I can't use the letter board because I can't point. Well, the individual does not need to be able to point. The use is, uh, the use is called partner assisted scanning. So I hold this letter board in front of the individual and I look down and I say, is your first letter in this row, this row, this row? If they nod or blink, I say, okay, I, J, K, L. They nod or blink and I'm like, okay, L is your first letter, next letter. Same with a picture board. And this is an eye gaze board where the individual looks into a quadrant. And so if they're looking up here and I see they're looking up here, I say, okay, is the letter J, K, or L? And they blink or nod. And I know that I'm at the right letter. And then we move on. You can use laser pointers. These are mounted on the head or the hand. So you can see here this, this person here on the bottom left, it is monitor, It is mounted on a set of glasses and it can be used with the alphabet or pictures on a large poster board or a small poster board, but the individual moves the laser pointer red dot to the letter that they want, the caregiver can see it, and then they move on to the next letter or the next picture. There are communication apps for both iPads and Android phones and tablets, and these are either free or very low cost. You download them, you start typing, and the device will read out loud whatever you have typed into it. And they come in both text-based and picture-based apps. Mounting for devices, both communication devices or iPads, say your loved one likes to watch a lot of movies but you, you know, they don't wanna to continue to look down because that hurts their neck. Well, you can buy mounts that can be mounted on both a wheelchair you, or a table um, or on wheels so that you can take this from room to room. And this mount I think is about $45 on Amazon. In terms of computer access, head mouse, replaces the standard computer mouse for people who cannot use or have limited use of their hands. So the head mouse trans translates movements of a user's head and moves the mouse cursor around the screen. So you have on the left, one of the newer head mouses called a glass house, and on the right, one of the older ones, which has a receiver that is attached to a communication device or a computer, and the user is wearing a dot between her eyebrows. And as she's moving around, that dot is corresponding to the transmitter or the transceiver. And the cursor is moving around the screen like I am doing right now. And the idea is you dwell on a letter for a set amount of time and it types that letter for you. And the use of eye gaze allows the user to operate the computer or a communication device via eye movement. Insurance may pay for the entire portion of a speech generating device, or some insurances have a percentage. They'll pay for 80% or 50%. But the concepts behind an eye gaze is that there is a camera mounted on the bottom of a computer screen. And it can be a traditional camera like this or a bar like this, but there are cameras that are embedded in here that are 
um, looking for the user's retina. And so you calibrate the machine and the computer software tells you how good your calibration was. And then once you're calibrated, the same concept as a head mouse is that you have an on-screen keyboard and you move your eyes to the letter that you want and it will type it for you. And you can use both the head mouse and the eye gaze, not only for communication, but for internet access, for emails, for um, web, web surfing, um, shopping, anything that you want to do on the internet. And wheelchairs can be very convenient for the caregiver, and you can get a lightweight uh, transport chair. This is just to get your loved one from point A to B. It's not meant to sit on all day. As you can see, it does not have a cushion, but it will get them into the doctor's office, into the grocery store or through the mall. And they are lightweight at 17 pounds so that the caregiver is not putting a 50 pound um, wheelchair into the trunk of a car. You can get a featherweight manual wheelchair. This one weighs 13 pounds. And of course, your complex power wheelchairs um, which are not only used for transportation, but for comfort. So most of the wheelchairs that you will see for people with ALS have a feature called tilted space as pictured here. What this does is it gets the individual 45 to 55 degrees back to alleviate the pressure on the buttocks and hopefully prevent sores. They also can have a feature called recline, which is pictured here, where the individual can lay down um, and I have some individuals who just find it easier to just sleep in the chair. Seat elevators are devices that will bring the chair up to what is called bar stool height. These can really help with transfers um, because the, the higher the individual is, the easier it is to get them into a standing position. Unfortunately, these are not covered under insurance. They're considered a caregiver convenience um, under Medicare, excuse me. Some private insurances may pay for them, but under Medicare, it is still considered a caregiver convenience. If you are interested in a seat elevator, you have to get the elevator installed when the chair is ordered. It cannot be installed after the chair is delivered. There are organizations that will uh, assist people with uh, getting a, a seat elevator. So reach out to your ALS care coordinator for more details on that. With wheelchair controls, um, obviously ALS being progressive neurological disease, your wheelchair, will, your wheelchair controls will change as the disease progresses. So most people will start off with a typical joystick, but know that the individual yeah, can independently continue to use their wheelchair. We just need to change the control. So we can put it under the chin here, or you can use uh, a head array system. So what a head array is, is that it has sensors embedded into the head array. So when I move my head to the left, I'm going to chair turn the chair to the left, to the right, it'll turn the chair to the right. When I uh, put my head back, it's going to drive the chair forward. And if I put my head in a neutral position, it will stop the chair. If the individual can no longer independently drive the wheelchair, there are caregiver controls as pictured here in the bottom right. The joystick has now been moved to the back of the wheelchair so that the caregiver can stand behind the person and drive the chair. That's convenient, especially when you're going through doorways. If a caregiver is trying to stand over here to the right and use the joystick, it is oftentimes hard to get through doorways. There are environmental control units that are embedded in the electronics of the wheelchair. So what this does is use Bluetooth technology so that an individual can not only drive their wheelchair, so say that's mode one, when they get to their destination, they go into mode two and the Bluetooth comes on and they can control their smartphone, a tablet or their communication device with the same mechanism that they are using to drive the power wheelchair. In terms of transfers, there are different techniques depending on how much your person with ALS is able to help. I always encourage people to reach out to your clinic occupational or physical therapist to talk about transfers. 
but there are devices that are are are, are uh, sorry that can be used to make transfers easier. So um, this one, the the picture in the middle is called a BZ board, and this disc just moves uh, from the the right side of the board to the left side of the board, or vice versa, so that the individual is on the disc and you're moving the disc to help transfer. The picture on the left is called a pivot disc, and this helps somebody um, be able to pivot. So the person needs to be able to stand. And once they're standing, that pivot disc moves to the right or to the left, so that if the wheelchair was right here, the person would stand, the, the caregiver helps the person pivot, and then they go down into the wheelchair. There are patient transfer lifts that are available. The one on the upper right is a Hoyer lift and insurance does pay for a manual Hoyer lift. And the idea is the person is in a sling, the Hoyer lift is on wheels and the person can be moved throughout the house or from the bed into the bathroom if there's room on the Hoyer lift. There are more sophisticated patient lifts available. Uh, this one in the bottom right is a ceiling lift. It is not covered under insurance. It is a permanent lift that goes into the ceiling joist and you can get as many feet of, of the, uh, of the uh, sorry, <laughs> the metal portion up here. And you can go from um, the living room into the bedroom, into the bathroom. You can get as many feet of track as you want, all right? Um, if you don't want something permanent, but you want an electronic motor, you can do a two post system, which is pictured here. And so this is an electronic motor. And again, the person is in a sling and they can go from the bed and say, this is the wheelchair over here easily. This patient lift, um, it's again, a two post lift. It is portable. So if you're traveling and you want to bring it with you, you could certainly do that. It breaks down. In terms of ramping, you have wood ramps or steel ramps. Wood can be sometimes more costly than steel and aluminum, and it is permanent. So, you know, it can't be taken down when you're done with it. I mean, it can, but it, it's a process and it does need a permit. Steel and aluminum ramps can be placed in a matter of hours. And they, all ramps, by the way, need to end in gravel or on um, a cement. Uh, driveway. The question is, is your house rampable? So all ramps have to be built to ADA guidelines. And the legal requirement is for every one inch of drop of, on the steps, you need one foot of ramp. The ADA also says if, that if the ramp is more than 30 feet, you have to have a landing and that the minimum width of a ramp is 36 inches. If you only have one or two steps, you can certainly use a suitcase or a roll up ramp. I only recommend suitcase ramps for people that are only using it, using a wheelchair. Notice they do not have railings like the modular ramp or the wood ramp I just showed you. So if somebody is using a suitcase ramp and they don't have great balance, they can fall right off if they're just using a walker or a rollator. I mean, it's up to you if you would like to do that. It's just a word of caution that they do not have railings. But suitcase ramps come anywhere from two feet to six feet. And the idea is they're foldable. So up here on the upper left, uh, the suitcase ramp is folded in half and then it is just placed um, in a car or in the house. Threshold ramps are great if you just have like a small threshold step here, or if you have a sliding glass door. Know that power wheelchairs without an individual in them are around 400 pounds. So imagine that going over the rails here of the sliding glass door repeatedly. Of course, it's going to impact that. So to protect it, you're going to use a suitcase ramp. And they, once the person goes through the sliding glass doors, um, this particular model allows you to close the door, but if you're using something like this, you just take it up and close the door. If the if your house cannot accommodate a ramp, the, 
the steps are too steep or um, another configuration makes it impossible, there are exterior stair lifts that can get the individual up the set of stairs. They do need to end on a cement slab as pictured here. You can get an exterior stair lift for just you know the five steps as pictured here, or for people that have to live on the second floor as pictured here um, due to um, uh, zoning restrictions that don't allow people to live on the first floor. This is a typical house that you would see uh, in my area that I service um, in the Jersey Shore, because all the shore areas now require that living um, spaces have to be on the second floor or above. And these exterior stair lifts can be exposed, as you can see here, or you can enclose them uh, to keep them protected from the elements. If your house cannot accommodate a ramp, or if you have multiple levels in your home and the individual needs to get from one level to another, the stair. you can use stair climbers. And I just wanna show you a brief video. This is a training video, um, but it gives you the idea of what a stair climber can do for an individual. Stair lift back until the tracks are resting flat on the bottom stairs. Once the tracks are resting on the stairs, Press the up button while pressing the handlebar towards the, the stairs. The caregiver is doing nothing more than gliding while or guiding. Or descending stairs. The, the electronics should are be doing all the work perpendicularly here. towards the staircase to maximize friction between the tracks and stairs. As you go around the curve of the staircase, continue to press the handlebar down and apply pressure to the right or left to guide the tracks around the curve. When you reach the top of the stairs, continue holding the up button and moving backward on the tips of the tracks until the front wheels have cleared the edge of the landing. Only then, lean the handlebars forward to return the stair lift to its bottom four wheels. If you need to move across a straight landing to another staircase, you may keep the chair balanced on the bottom of the tracks as you press the up button and walk backwards to the next staircase. Once you have reached the final landing, turn the spring-loaded knob to slide the handlebar So down that works, and obviously, going up and down steps. This is uh, transportable too, so if you're traveling and you know you're going somewhere with multiple steps, you could use this. This can be used on interior and exterior steps. For the motorized version of this chair, they usually start around $1,800. So I wanna move on to bathrooms um, because they can be hazardous. The most common location for falls in the home was in the bathroom, I'm sorry, um, including um, people that are hurrying and people that are trying to transfer in the bathroom. So, it is recommended that if you are using a wheelchair, you never want to transfer from the wheelchair onto the toilet, for example, the power wheelchair. You want to use a special wheelchair that is designed for um, toileting use. You want to transfer in a larger room onto the specialized chair and then roll the chair into the bathroom. So, to avoid transfers um, at night, especially, you know, caregivers are tired, the individual ALS doesn't have a lot of energy to get up. There are both uh, exterior catheters for both male and female. For men, it's called a condom catheter, and for females, it's called the Purewick system, so that the individual can lay in bed at night if they just have to urinate you can use these external catheters and everyone can go back to bed without ever having to get up and do a transfer and go to the bathroom. You can also, if the individual can still do so, use a bedside commode. This is pictured here. So obviously this person's in bed, the commode's right here. They do their business and get back into bed. If you're thinking, okay, I want to have an accessible bathroom. The ideal is to have an open concept bathroom with a roll in shower, which means the shower is flush to the floor. Obviously, we know that bathroom modification is very expensive. The average cost in the United States is around $25,000. Um, not everyone can afford to do so. So I'm gonna be talking about devices that you can use in your current bathroom that will keep 
the person with ALS and their caregivers safe. But if you are thinking about redoing your bathroom, the ideal is to have something like these, open concept. If you have a small bathroom, the new um, movement within the, the accessibility community is to use something called a wet bath. This are, these are bathrooms where everything here can get wet. And see, there's no delineation between the toilet area and the shower area. You just bring in the, the rolling shower chair, which is a chair, chair designed to get wet, get under the shower, dry off, and out you go. Um, and so they're, they're similar to um, RV bathrooms because that's a bathroom. They, everything can get wet because it's a small space. Same here. So you want to use a rolling shower chair when you're talking about bathing someone or toileting someone. These are chairs that are designed to get wet, but not only are they designed to get wet, they have cutouts, as you can see here, for toileting. So um, if, for example, you were using this particular chair, and I mentioned that you want to do the transfer in a large room, you would put the individual with ALS in the chair. The chair is on casters, so it turns on a dime. And you would put the person with ALS on the chair and then bring this chair into the bathroom and back it over the toilet. In terms of toileting assistance, if the person is having difficulty getting up off of the toilet, you're going to need to add some type of grab bars. So the, the, uh, the picture here on the left are, uh, this is almost like a bedside commode that um, has a raised toilet seat. And again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, the higher the person uh, is, is sitting up, the easier it is to do transfers. So that's why this is sitting higher than the toilet bowl. What you do not want is something just called a toilet riser. This is just clamped on with rubber clamps and the individual, if they're not steady, can fall right off. So you want something that has four feet on the floor. This is a toilet lift, which is a relatively new product. And it's an electronic lift that can get you up and down off of the toilet seat. This is great for use as long as the individual can independently walk into the bathroom. And if not, then they're gonna to have to have a caregiver stand in front of them to spot them and then put them into a shower chair um, and then take them out of the bathroom. Again, going with the higher you're seated, the easier it is to get on and off, especially a commode. So the standard toilets that are available are 14 inches. You can now get tall toilets, which are 17 or 18 inches. If you still need more height, you can get a toilet elevator and they are devices that go under the toilet and can give you anywhere from one and a half to three and a half inches more in height. Of all the devices that I recommend throughout my career, I get the most positive feedback on bidets because I ask the individual with ALS, what is it that you don't want your loved one to do? And of course, you know, the answer will be, you know, um, hygiene. So bidets can um, be added over your existing toilet seat and they can clean, dry, sanitize. What you want is to get a bidet that has a detachable remote control as pictured here. Because if the individual still has the hand function that they can control it, that's great. But if not, the caregiver can be outside the room and operating the bidet for them. Most people at first will say to me, well, I'm just gonna use a bedside commode like this picture here and put that over in my toilet because the, there's the rails, it's height adjustable, that's great. And that's fine to use, except that this cannot be used with a bidet because it already has an existing toilet seat. So then the water can't get through here. So if you're going to be using a bidet, you're going to have to have some type of grab bars that are either in the wall or do not have a toilet seat that is blocking the water. And this is just a, a testimony of one of my local 
people with ALS and he's just saying how wonderful the bidet was because he feared going to the bathroom before, but now he does not. So I do get a lot of people who say to me, I don't want to install grab bars because other people are using the toilet. Well, then use retractable grab bars. The idea is when the individual who needs them, they pull them down. When they are done, they put them back against the wall. These are height adjustable, as you can see here. Um, and I also have a lot of people say, well, I can't um, install the grab bar because I don't, I can't find the studs behind the wall. There is a product uh, from a company called Wing It. These are grab bar anchors and they sell anchors to go into different materials, fiberglass or um, wood. So they act as a stud and um, they are about $20, $25 for a bag of wingets and they can hold up to 600 pounds of pressure. Standard poles are tension poles that go between the ceiling and the floor. And this uh, portion of the pole where the individual is holding it is height adjustable. So if you have a taller person, you can move it up, shorter person, you can move it down. You can put standard poles anywhere in the house and it'll just help somebody get up with a pull motion. In terms of using a tub or a shower, you can use a tub transfer bench or system. So the ones pictured here are tub transfer benches. And the idea is, as long as the individual can independently walk into the room, they sit themselves on this piece and then this piece slides into the tub or the, or the shower. This one has a swivel seat. So the individual could walk in and this is actually, picture this at a 90 degree angle here. They sit their buttocks on it, then they move um, or rotate the seat and then they roll or glide into the shower or the tub. This particular model is called a sliding tub transfer system. And it's taking a rolling shower chair, which I showed you earlier, and it is attached on these rails and then the whole system goes into the tub or the shower. If there is a situation where the individual has to live on the first floor and there's no shower on the first floor, there are portable showers available. There's two different types. There's one called a shower bay and one called a faucet. They operate in the same realm as there is a pump that's pictured here and there is tubing, which is pictured all the way over here on the left with the shower bay. And you can get as many feet of tubing as you need, but you put one end of the tube on a faucet and the other tube is in a sink. So once the water is on, it's water in, water out. The, the shower bay is, uh, when once it's set up, it stays set up where the faucet can be broken down and put away. And that's what it looks like when it's broken down. But of course, once you decide that you're going to, the, the individual is going to shower, you need to set it up all over again. So in terms of uh, safety for the steps, there are stair glides that are available. These are safe to use for someone with ALS as long as they have trunk support. If they start listing to one side or the other, your doctors and your therapists are going to tell the individual to stop using the stair glide because they can fall out of it. There's no uh, trunk support in these stair glides. You can get uh, stair glides for straight shot staircases, which usually start around $3,000. Anything that has a curve or a landing is considered a custom stair glide. You're looking at starting those around $8,000. In lieu of a stair glide, you can certainly consider using an interior stair lift. Uh, the one pictured here with a manual because they only uh, can carry the weight of a manual. Um, goes up and down the steps, but you do need 45 inches of clearance in order to make this work. The, this one over here on the right is an interior platform lift. And so if this was somebody's home and this was a hallway with a railing, you take out the railing and the lift goes from this floor to this floor and the person backs out. Of course, you can consider doing a home elevator, the traditional kind where you cut 
a hole in the ceiling and it goes from one floor to the other. That's the most expensive <clears throat> option that you can do. Usually uh, interior elevators are around 50 to $60,000. Feeding assistance, there are um, robotic feeders is the one picture here. This is called an Obi. Um, the one on the right, this is actually a robotic arm. The only funding source I know for this arm is through the Veterans Administration, because unfortunately this is about $30,000. Then you can get um, feeding arms that are attached to a table and basically help the individual move their arm from the bowl or the plate to their mouth. In terms of drinking assistance, Lack of hydration can actually cause increased secretions for somebody with ALS. It can cause constipation, which can lead to hospitalization. I get a lot of caregivers who say, I have to work, but my loved one can't get access to their water or their juice. Well, you can use extra long straws. You can um, buy a mount for a cup that can be mounted on the side of a hospital bed, or you can use a, a drinking aid like this one, which can hold anywhere from 16 to 20 ounces. And you can get this curvable straw in many different feet. And so you put it on the back of the wheelchair and the ind individual can independently take drinks as many as they want. In terms of hospital beds, you can get one usually covered under insurance, uh, just the traditional hospital bed. Some private insurances will cover more complex hospital beds. And then some of our folks are opting just to go out and purchase an adjustable bed for comfort. Transportation, can the individual still um, transfer into a car? If they can, that's great. But as you can see pictured here, it is a lot of effort on the caregiver to get somebody who's very uh, dependent for help into a vehicle. Power wheelchairs, once they're in use, cannot break down and, not, and cannot be transported in a car. You will need a specialized van for that. So you can get a handicapped accessible van. Approximate cost is around $45,000 to $55,000 new. These vans can be rented, purchased, or leased. Most people opt for a minivan, but they are, are available in full-size vans too. If you live in an area that is uh, that you have public transit, you then will have an arm of public transit called paratransit because that's a federal law. And paratransit is a shared ride public service and is used for people with disabilities. And as long as there's a bus route around you, you will have paratransit. You do have to order paratransit in advance. It's not free, it's the same cost as a bus fare but it does take you door to door. But as important to know, never door through door. So you have to have a caregiver with you because the bus driver will not take you into the building. And I wanna finish off talking about how to get out of your home in the event of an emergency. Say for example, a fire. If you're a caregiver and you are just home alone, you can get something called an evacuation aid it's basically a tarp. The, the, the caregiver wraps the person up like a burrito and pulls. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but yes, it will get you out in the event of a fire. There are other aids that are available. This is a two person um, seat. Um, it's again, made of tarp, but it's designed for two people because as you can see here, there's loops on either side. And if you have a more petite person, you can certainly use one um, as a backpack, put them on your back and run. There are evacuation chairs. I showed you a video of a stair climbing chair. Well, these are the same premise, getting somebody out in the event of an emergency and they are they can be electronic or non-electronic. So this is the electronic one, again, on a track system with a motor. This is um, just one that does not have a motor. You will see these in schools and airports and malls all the time to, to help people get down the steps in the event of an emergency. I always, always recommend people have a go bag. And a go bag is an emergency bag that's kept near 
an exit of your home. And if you're a caregiver and you have to call an ambulance, for example, um, in the go bag will be everything that your person with ALS needs to go to the hospital, a copy of their medical records, a communication board if they can't speak, um, their advanced directives if you want to put it in there, uh, a, a cell phone charger, um, anything that you would want the hospital to have. Or if you live in an area that is prone to natural disasters, you have a go bag in case you have to evacuate and you can customize your go bag. The content suggested listed here are what FEMA suggests, but of course you can customize it to whatever you want it to do. And I encourage you to reach out to the ALS Association, to myself, to Cynthia, to your care, care service coordinator with any questions that you may have, um, not only about ALS, but about products that you feel might help your loved one with ALS. And with that, I will um, bring it back to Cynthia. Oh, Alisa, thank you so much. That's uh, That was actually a fabulous overview of um, items that certainly support safety, first off, mm -hmm. and, um, and really comfortable mobility within the home, not only for the person that has ALS, but again, our focus on, um, on caregivers and making it, it safe for them to assist folks. Um, just a couple of quick things that came over. Uh, my computer. And, and before I share some comments, I just wanted um, to alert folks because our focus today is on safe caregiving. I wanted to make sure our audience was aware that a no cost virtual home modification and safety assessment of their home is available through their local chapter. Um, Alisa, would you just take uh, 30 seconds or so to share with people uh, the features and benefits of that no cost virtual home modification and safety assessment? Sure. So really, when you look at home modification and safety, you want to look at it from the eyes of ALS. I'm not saying that home OT and PTs don't look at it that way, but most of them are not exposed to ALS and they don't understand the disease process. So when we get a virtual home modification uh, referral, you're going to have an ALS professional look at your home and determine the best devices to keep both the caregiver and the patient safe. Most people want to remain in their home. So having someone with the knowledge of ALS take a look at the home is imperative. Um, again, for safety, I stress safety because a fall can be detrimental for a person with ALS and their caregiver. A caregiver can be of no use to you if they are injured. So reach out to your local care service coordinator if you are interested in this free virtual assessment. Great, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate that. I know um, these days, most people do have access to a tablet or, or even their, their cell phone where they can utilize you know, FaceTime or Duo um, and access um, a virtual support or assessment. Um, a couple of quick questions. I know we're, we're moving up against our 60 minute allocation. Um, do I need a plumber to install the bidet? Please note, I do want it to provide warm water. <laughs> um, no, you don't necessarily need a plumber if you have somebody handy. Um, and I should mention that all the bidets that are available in the United States have to be plugged into a ground fault outlet. There's no wiggle room. So what I often hear is that people can, you know, they they don't have a problem installing the bidet, but they need an electrician to come in and put a ground fault outlet near the toilet. Oh, good to know. Great. Thanks so much. You know, we do um, have lots of comments and questions about those bidets. I'm not surprised that you said that was uh, one of your uh, client's favorite uh, favorite pieces of equipment. Um, another, well, this is a comment. That remote doorbell is great. I keep the button in the bathroom. I only need help to get off, underlined, only need help to get off the toilet. So again, a very inexpensive um, piece of equipment to assist in, in caregiving. Um, and then Elisa, um, question, 
Are those aluminum ramps purchase only or can we rent them? Uh, both. It depends on the company that you're working with. Um, my local company does not rent, but I have other people in the United States who do rent them and they pay a monthly rental fee. Wonderful. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. Again, um, I appreciate everyone carving time out of their day. Note that this is recorded and will be available on the ALS Association website. Thanks so much and everyone extending wishes for a safe afternoon. Thank you. Take care.